<laughs> well, you fiddle with your sideways alfalfa. <laughs> yeah. Actually, actually, what's funny about that is like I actually have uh, these two calyx in the back of my head that same any it, uh, the people who cut my hair they're just like these are such a pain to cut and like simmer down like try living with them exactly it's just like yeah well <laughs> try yeah. living with them people give me a break it's like Jeez. no matter how much i like you know to pat the hair down it's it's always going to be yeah poofed up like so poof, poof. there's like it, 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 so there's there's this weird middle ground. It's like either cut it really short to overcome them or yeah. I grow them long and I can't do that. So <laughs> I've never been just, able to grow just long here. Except, except you need to allow yeah. Cormac, you need to work on allowing. Yeah. There was this, uh, this good <laughs> quote on Twitter that a friend of mine sent me today. Don't live in peace. Live in truce with all of your conflicting ideas. And I like that. Live in truce. <laughs> just, that, just surrender you know, here, and allow. That is that is like the subtitle to architecture. Just live in yeah. truce. <laughs> you know. Live in truce. <laughs> that is. It is because it's I, I, I was watching some some videos earlier today that were talking about uh some tech products and stuff and it, mm -hmm. and they were it didn't come across to it didn't paint the architects in a in a in a as good a light as i would have hoped great, great. But, and it was an engineer speaking and the engineer was like you know the architects want to want to make a, a beautiful piece of art and uh, the engineers want to do it faster and cheaper and and pump them out you know and i'm just like thinking and and, and then she she says you know we just it, this it's all about the compromise <laughs> Yeah, which is which is true, <laughs> which is true because if you how think, she got there, I didn't necessarily enjoy. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been on over the past few weeks, few months with new user groups and stuff, and it really is all about the compromise. It's like, okay, you want this big, huge idea, we want that, but you're not going to be able to get all of that. So it's what is the compromise? What what can the building? What can the engineering, right. what can the architecture afford to give you that gets you close to what you want without, like, not saying without giving you what you want. I mean, we always try to give them what they want, but because yeah. of, you know, this, we've said a thousand times, I mean, this is an existing building, you know, really, really low floor to floor height and all this other things. It can only give you just so much. And I think most of my job has been mitigating the that middle ground like they watch too much hgtv it's like <clears throat> oh let's just pop this ceiling the, up and we're gonna expose the the beams and we're gonna get an amazing daylight and you're like well actually we're in like a mid floor and the exactly. floor to floor <laughs> exactly <laughs> well i i've i've heard so many times it's like well you know in my old space i've got all of this and I can do this and I can do that. And you're like, That's well, your old this is the, your old space was probably designed <laughs> to actually accept being a lab building. And this on the other hand was not, you know, this was a yeah. 1960s building with a low floor to floors. And it was, a, it was, it had window units rather than a central system. And so, and now you're, you're trying thinking to creatively enough. I'm going to just call you on the carpet right now. <laughs> We can punch holes in we, floors and we can remove the program above because it's not as important as the program that needs to go into this space. Am I right? We, you know, you know how many times we get called on the carpet just for it's that, you know, it's just like, you know, we, we've, we've really got to think, you know, we really need we, you to think more creatively. Yeah, it's yeah. like, you <laughs> know, we need to start thinking outside of the box. You got to tell me <laughs> oh, man, what we I can love it. do. Like, yeah. Let's get out of the box. Let's definitely in your 1960s. Low floor to floor height yeah. box. Let's get out of that box. <laughs> Let's which get out of, of that course, box. <laughs> which, of course, all of the existing drawings and all of the what was assumed to be the existing conditions was a flat out lie. And, mm. you know, to make it. To make it but what a, they mean when they want you to get out of the box is they want you to get out of the physical, real world constraints because you're telling them something they don't want to hear. 
right? That's the box that they want you to get out of. Sure, sure. And present them with a new image of something they do want to hear. Um, and, and that's all up to you to get oh, out of that box yeah. to, and, and do. Yeah. It's so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of boxes, Cormac, speaking of boxes. I mean, what? this episode, I was doing a little bit of uh, research before we hit. Yeah, there's your box. Bef- before we hit record, this is uh, the beginning of year 12 of the Arca Speak podcast, which is a box of sorts. I, yeah. That was a good segue, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Where we need to uh, add like the little confetti coming down. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Didn't Streaming we, confetti. I believe we Yay. published um, our first episode or we started our first year on my birthday, February 3rd of whatever 12 years ago was, 2012. Yep. Yep. And uh, 2013. So this will be, so we did it 11 years ago. This will be season 12. All the math works out. Trust me. I'm a, okay. I'm a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's crazy though. I did not, uh, we, we never had a plan. I mean, this is accidental and, yeah. on some level and, uh, and here we are still going strong, the strongest ever. Yeah. No, I, maybe. I, don't know. I, mean, I just, just made that claim. I don't know if it's true or not. No, no, no. It is it, the strongest mm. ever. Do you feel it? I feel strong. I feel... Nice. <laughs> I was going to say, back in the day when we first started recording. Oh, my gosh. Honestly, I remember a couple of different people would say, oh, I'm going to go back and listen to all of the episodes. I'm like, don't, don't. Shaking just your head. Like, yeah. you, know. you just start shaking your head immediately. You know what they're about to say. You just say, no, you know, just go you don't back have to. a little just, if you want. Don't. You know, exactly. Like, Don't go way back. There's 12 years of it. And yeah, in the early years, we were doing it every two weeks and, you know, not every week. And, but I think that the first years were audio-wise. Oh, my Lord. I was Ooh. I was. Well, we were learning how to podcast. We were everybody was every, learning how to podcast every, back 12, then. Year, 12 years ago, everybody was learning how. Now everybody is. <laughs> right. <laughs> I now, mean, how, now you can just really, you can buy a really good microphone for really cheap on Amazon and have it the next day. You could start podcasting. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> get, get a, you know, get a good webcam if you're going to do video, get a good microphone if you're going to. It's easy you know, now. Exactly. These kids don't know how easy they've got it. Exactly. Back in the These day. These kids today. When, Back when podcasting was black and white. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when pod- the other way to say it would be like oh uh, eight bit mono. I don't that that would be the audio version of black and black. <laughs> it wasn't wasn't eight bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm exaggerating a little bit. But... Yeah, whatever the uh whatever that you know, yeah. 64K. Oh, yeah, that's what that's what we would We'd pump it out at the, at the high, high quality of 64K uh, mono audio files. It's gotten a little bit better. It doesn't really matter. It's just spoken word. People can hear us. They, yeah. It's all the, yeah. And and now the tools are have changed a lot. Our pipeline, our workflows have changed a yeah. lot. But uh, nobody needs to be any wiser about that because yeah. all they need to do is receive, receive the podcast. Yeah, I mean. And enjoy. I remember how much we would all complain when we were work sharing the editing about how horrible, you know, it's just like, I just spent six and a half, eight hours on the edit for a 35 minute show or a 45 minute show. And you're just (laughs) right. Welcome to architecture. The perfectionist uh, architect there is is editing to the nth. I still, I will still say that I still edit certain of my own kind of, you know, just like, do I really sound like that? No, I'm going to fix that. <laughs> uh, you have the luxury of, of yeah. being in charge of, of the design of the output. So I'll, I'll, you get I'll, to make that. I'll dumb Evan down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> he said something smart. I'm cutting that out. <laughs> and then, and then the part afterwards where you repeat it, just go with that part. So yeah. Sound. Or yeah, exactly. That, or wait. that's how it usually goes. Cormac. Um, 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 <laughs> Um. <laughs> so yeah i mean did you see this milestone coming have you had it marked on your calendar or are you like my wife who and i'm like happy anniversary and she's like today 
<laughs> I yeah, today's like this year's interesting bunch of milestones. I mean, I'll be hitting my uh 25th wedding anniversary. My mm. wife will turn <laughs> ages years old. Yeah, you're not allowed stuff. to say. You're yeah. not allowed to say. <laughs> But it, which is a big milestone for her. I mean, we were just talking about it, you know, because we, you know, we're realizing that this year was our 25th wedding anniversary that <clears throat> we were like, how old, what, you know, she, she had just turned 22 when I met her and... You're just making it easy for people to do the math. Well, <laughs> see, exactly. <laughs> see, I could say it without saying it. You can you can say it without saying it, and you can edit this part of the podcast. <laughs> and I can so edit this part out if I so say. choose. Which, if you choose, she ain't she probably so. won't. No, yeah, I won't. <laughs> good thing. That's a good thing. She's not listening. She'd be like, "What is the point?" Exactly. Just like, yeah. oh, so you didn't say I was hitting the big five zero? <laughs> like, no, no, I didn't. I didn't say Boom, it. Well, you we... just dropped it. Exactly. Yeah. Jeez. So careful. So... Lightning may strike. She knows all. Well, it'll be a lot slower because she's older. <laughs> slow lightning. <laughs> That's what we call her. Slow lightning. Yeah, you can. You're, What's your all superhero you have to do is stay name? One slow one step lightning. ahead of her. Slow lightning. So, what's new in the, in architecture land? That's that's different from twelve years ago. I mean, we've we've oh wow gone through a pandemic. Yes, you're fully remote. Yeah, I don't work at the firm that I used to work at. We're both licensed. Yeah, uh, a lot of milestones have happened along the way. Yeah. I, I, those are just the ones off the top of my head. I mean, in just you know the so like the way we work, right? Mm -hmm. Twelve years ago, it was everybody butts in seats. Project teams were were not remote. We were not didn't have the luxury. I mean, we we may have had teleconferencing, but it wasn't. It wasn't something that was so widely used. You know, if, if the meetings, if we had to have a meeting that was a teleconference, it was, people knew how to use the phone. Yeah. <laughs> you had a polycom in the middle of the yeah. desk, right? In the conference yeah. room. And it was, or, or a regular phone on speakerphone with the door closed. Right. And right. it was not, it, not at all. So, so technology's changed a lot, but like, as far as the practice well, goes well, and even... project delivery, I, I mean, there's a. It hasn't changed that much, <laughs> has it? It, well, there, there's slowly but surely, and we've we've talked about this, the slow but surely adoption of digital rather than paper submissions, things mm -hmm. like that, which hopefully are the precursor for other delivery methods in the future. Um, Maybe, yeah. We are now. <laughs> it's it's funny. It's like. Think about how many different technologies have come about throughout the course of architecture and, and even the course of our careers or just slightly before our careers, CAD, BIM, and all of these other things. And now what's the next big evil that everybody's worried about? AI. Yeah. You know. Well, and it's, it's working its way into CAD and BIM and exactly. every, every possible tool that you and can use that, so that all know, these companies can uh, seem to be relevant. So, you know, it's back then it was like hope for to facilitate and make us more productive. And hopefully this is to facilitate and make us more productive. There are so many people out there sharpening their pitchforks and getting their torches ready for the AI is going to take us over. It's going to do away with the architect. And I was just like, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. But, but even... It, I think it does make the possibility of disruption from outside of architecture much more of a threat than internally, because I think the perspective that you just shared is like, you know how slow things are to change yeah. within the profession, Yeah, which which I, I agree. I mean, there will be definitely some firms, the big firms with lots of resources who are actively working on this kind of stuff. But um, most, most of the profession is not that, right? So I, I would probably agree with you that uh, from the perspective from within the profession is slow adoption, if adoption at all. Right. There's still people, we see them on the our Entre Architect face group, people are just now thinking about going into BIM, right? Just, right. just starting. Just and, now, um, in and, 2024. Right. And, and so 
I, I agree with that perspective, but I, my, I do think it is making it even more of a potential threat from the outside to just say, what do we, what do we need architects for? And that is kind of a, you know, yeah. that, that's an extreme for sure. And, and it's not, yeah. that won't, that switch won't flip overnight either, but it, it just makes it even more of a potential that I think people should be paying attention to. Well, if we struggle to answer the question of what do we need architects for now <clears throat> in like, say the time, pro, you know, we'll call it pre, pre AI. So, you know, 2024 PAI. <laughs> um, it's funny because AI has been worked on for decades, oh, right? But, exactly. but now it's just, it's just, it just popped through the surface and took everybody by surprise. So, so yeah, we're not, we are aware of that. Yeah, right? yeah. And so there's, there's yeah. people listening. We're like, what, this is not, but I mean, let, it, let's it, just say it's new for most people. When I say PAI, you know, or pre AI, it's, you know, pre adoption as the norm. Yeah. Whereas like we had our pre BIM before it was the adoption of the norm. Which is still, you know, kills me that there are people out there who haven't adopted some form of it. And I get that, you know, people are like, well, if, you know, if I'm just going to do an addition to a house, you know, why do I really need to invest in a software that's so cumbersome to do something so small? I totally get that and totally agree with that. You know, there are the right tool for the right job, right? Uh, and so the question is, is how are you going to implement AI as the right tool for the right job? And are you, is it going to be something that you need? You, you might not even need it at all, but it, it's just, it's, it's interesting to see people afraid of things before they really get on there. And then we've got, you know, friends of a show that, that are out there that you would like sort of took me by surprise that. Like Bill Martin, who had just done a seminar for AIA New Jersey on AI. And mm -hmm. because he's mostly a custom residential guy, you know, and you wouldn't really see how he could leverage or use AI within that, but to, to basically. Soul practitioner of, too. Right? And, so total, and a soul practitioner. Exactly. Yeah. So you almost are like, why do you need it? But to be able to show people how they can leverage it from the sole practitioner to the, the large firms, you know, is, is that's kind of the forward thinking that we need to, to bring to the table and not just, you know, knee jerk reaction. Oh my God, you know, AI is going to take our job. I think, I think that knee jerk reaction goes both ways. There's the early adopters, which are all over it and yeah. singing the praises yeah. and showing the potential and all those things. Then there's the knee jerk reaction of, yeah, it's going to kill me. <laughs> I'm going to die. So yeah. it's the fight or flight kind of mentality, lizard brain kind of stuff. Um, and I do feel like we need to be somewhere in the middle of that because yeah. I mean, so for instance, like I said earlier, it's, it's so, so maybe the tools are different, but, but you know, 12 years ago, architects, 80% of architects who are doing, you know, sole practitioners or very small firms were using AutoCAD and SketchUp. And right. I think a lot of people are still using those same tools. So that's true, why true. I said, I don't know if the technology has changed much. Obviously, Revit was around for a long time already at that point. 2012, like the firm that I was at adopted Revit 100% in 2009. So hmm. it had already been going uh and and we're still using that today right which um, i would say that the complexity of those projects has gotten more and more but but it we haven't changed a lot massive yeah. sea change yeah. but now we're seeing ai in every single tool and so yeah. to talk about sketchup for a second right we're seeing ai diffusion rendering built into sketchup mm -hmm. and we have sole practitioners who already used tools so the new features are meeting people where they are Right. And at the same time, so so it gives people the the ability to dabble and to play with it and see what they like and don't like about it. And but at the right. same time, are those people reading the license agreement? Hmm. I I haven't Ooh. checked this myself. I mean, I know the answer is no, right? <laughs> Everybody just clicks okay. Yeah. Um. But but there is an exchange of information happening when you type in a prompt and get a response. You are sending information to Trimble. Yeah. And they are 
because all the AI rendering is happening in the cloud. So mm -hmm. there has to be an exchange. You can't do right. this if you're not connected to the internet and if you don't send data to Trimble. Right. And that's how all these companies are trying to get ahead, right? Is right. by right. they already have a huge user base. They're putting it into it, plugging it into a tool that tons of people already use, and it's basically like free training at that right. point. Right. Right. They're not having to purchase or make a, a licensing deal with some other training. They've got their own users opting in to do that. So yeah. yeah. And so this is why, you know, I I position this as okay, there's the there's the Luddite idea, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like it's gonna kill us. And then yeah. there's the 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 champions who are out there pushing forward at, at at whatever cost and then there's kind of this cautious you you do need to read the license agreement for these tools you also need to know what they're capable of and if it's useful and valuable to you as a practice and if you're willing to make that compromise look at us we brought compromise. it back there we go <laughs> <laughs> but the main tool set that we're using although i agree everything is kind of being upended right now with ai is has not changed very much in the last dozen years. I mean, the, the main tools are still the main tools. This episode is made possible with support from Chaos Enscape. Enscape is a plugin software that simplifies real-time visualization for us in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Whether your go-to design application is Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, ARCHICAD, or Vectorworks, Enscape lets you instantly create high-quality renderings by syncing data from your 3D model without additional import or export needed. Easily navigate every aspect of your design in real time and identify and resolve any issues you come across quickly. Plus, you can immerse your clients in VR to provide a tangible sense of the project. Enscape is the trusted choice of over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries. They are soon launching something special that will make your 3D workflow the best 3D workflow for a special price. In the meantime, you can experience it for yourself for free at chaos-enscape.com slash trial-14 or simply by Googling Try Enscape. Thanks to Chaos Enscape for their support of this episode. And now let's get back to the conversation. It's interesting that you went to the user agreement because one of, I don't know, a couple, uh, I don't know, like maybe a month or so ago, I started dabbling with that AI image generator that you had, you know, turned me on to and mm -hmm. we had talked about it on the show. And so we were, I was, I'd kind of gone through and was messing around with things and got to a handful of images. I was like, wow, I'm like pretty impressed at how, you know, it was like starting with something that was very close to the sketch that I'd created. And then just these iterations of prompts and stuff that got it to something completely different. And, right. you know, I posted it kind of singing the praises of it. And people started to like, you. I, some people were like, oh, this is amazing. You know, I can't wait, you know, for, to either try this out. And then of course, like every friend of mine who was a traditional artist, they were like, you know, absolutely against it and everything else. Mm. But the thing that, you know, where I'm going with this is that they are very copious posters on like Instagram and threads and all of these other tools that get their artwork out there, get their artwork noticed, noticed and everything else. They're freely putting their work out into the ether, not paying attention to the, ownership. the fine print and yeah. the ownership of things where, you know, when people are like, oh, I can't believe that Facebook is doing this or Facebook is doing that. You're like, well, you're the one who decided to join a free service and freely put your information out there without mm -hmm. reading the fine print on how they would use it. Same thing with all of these image-based social medias is like, how did you go through and see what they're going to do with it? Or, or, you know, so you're as culpable in giving away your artwork as you are with fighting the fact that they're going to use your artwork. 
you know. I, yeah, yeah, it's the same argument, but they're yeah, I, I see what kind you're of saying. A, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a weird catch twenty two where you know it's like e- yeah. obviously we yeah. don't want you know, it's, and I'm going to be on their side is like I don't want you know somebody to steal my artwork to use it as something to generate their their work and then them pass off their work you know my work is their work kind of thing i absolutely don't want any of that but in turn though when i post things out there in the real world and i'm not paying attention to all of the fine print of how they're going to use it it's sort on me you know i mean Mm -hmm. i i i ignorantly let them do it and image generation is just one aspect of all this, right? Like there's so many different variations on these tools. One of the ones that I think is going to become, you know, we touched on this in our last episode when we mentioned Apple Vision Pro yeah. and spatial computing. And I mean, we've been doing VR for a while now, yeah. and this isn't this isn't necessarily new, but I do think that there's some interesting potential with, you know, these these headsets to then come back and provide a feedback loop for what what the real built environment is like Mm. compared to what is possible in a virtual environment right we design physical environments but we we use digital environments to get there right so Mm. we're we're designing full 3d models in whatever software package you are so that you can coordinate the drawings but but we see the potential in what that enables us to do to coordinate things, right? Especially right, on right. complex, large projects where there's so much riding on cost because the projects are so big and involved to get the coordination right. Structural, HVAC, architectural, all of the different disciplines. And what's interesting is that we're creating this byproduct to get to the to the real thing, right? And right. this byproduct is spatial in nature right because you could use it as another potentially uh, revenue generating thing that you don't use it for now which Mm -hmm. is these spatial environments that people enjoy through a vr headset and i had a conversation with john manichiri on my other podcast and he has is he's the founder of a startup called treasury and they are creating a licensing mechanism for 3D spatial assets. Hmm. So you you create 3D spatial assets. Your firm does. Right. right? They own them. They own the copyright on those. Um, I create them. Right? I've I've designed buildings. You know, on my own side projects or sure, whatever. Sure. Uh, and and all for the purpose of truly getting built. But there is potentially, if that building is interesting, and there's definitely architecture firms and star architecture firms that create buildings that are highly interesting mm. and definitely kind of well they're intellectual property but they're probably right. even more more so for certain firms that have a, a brand identity that right. you associate architecture with yeah and so if you could hold your whatever meeting or presentation or something say in a zaha building mm-hmm. would you want to do that right it's a it's a pretty cool environment sure. right um and we talked about it on the last episode with the Disney Plus app as just a, a, a quick example, right? Which is I can watch Star Wars in Luke's land speeder as a digital environment, right? right, I'm not, right. And so there's there's a, a 3D asset there that has some, I mean, obviously it's in the Disney app, so they have the licensing rights to do that. There's potential here. And I think, you know, getting back to how how is the output that we create, whether you're an artist or you're an architect monetizable in new ways, I think is kind of interesting. And so this, I'll put a link to Treasury in the show notes. Uh, it's just launching and it coincides with the launch of the Apple Vision Pro headset just because it's it's good timing. But um, it, it is interesting to think about other ways in which architects could also leverage the things that they make along the way for put other potential income avenues. Right. Do we have buildings that are good enough to do that? I don't know the answer. But I, I think, you know, when it goes back to like this, using this well, stuff as training. Yeah. And the, 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 the I'm nervous about my models getting out there think, and, and being used for training. This licensing thing starts to actually well, make a lot of oh, sense it, it because absolutely does. it proves ownership of, of it as mine. Think about how we could expand 
education through being able to license these 3D environments. And so when we're talking about somebody creates a model, a full 3D photorealistic rendering of Villa Savoy, and <laughs> we just happen to be teaching a something about Villa Savoy, about Lake Corb and all these other ones, and we just... And, and, and you, you know, could go there. We, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We can't, you could go there. We, we can't like, we could walk the grounds. We can, we could like walk around, maybe not necessarily touch unless you have like the gloves that kind of have some like sensory, you know, cause some haptic feedback. Exactly. Exactly. But, but I mean, you know, I, I used the example of one time where I was silly enough that when we were assigned a project and I was supposed to do a project, you know, like write a paper and pull together graphics and a presentation about a, a specific Mies building in Detroit. And I hopped in the car and drove. Like, it's just like, there is no way for me to like truly write mm -hmm. something about the experience of this place without experiencing the place. I can, yeah. I can look at pictures in a magazine or a book or whatever all day long, but I'm never going to feel the space. And we can get closer and closer to actually feeling the space in this kind of this virtual reality of you know yeah. things like this, and and I see such a, a, a an upside to it. I mean, it, does it does it discourage you know travel? I mean, not every kid that who goes to architecture school can afford a trip to France. So, True, you know. I agree, and I think every architect should give anybody who wants to tour their building the ability to do oh, that, that from wherever great. they are think, and i think that that is i mean that that shows the marketing aspect people who have never put on a headset do not understand how real it feels and so yeah. is it real no it's not real but it is really close like it's incredibly close and it doesn't even have to be photorealistic your brain makes the leap and it it says it's okay for it not to be perfectly photorealistic it still works right. and it's just getting more and more close to photorealism mm -hmm. all the time right and right. it's it's absolutely incredible and and i agree with you like if if what is the difference of doing a case study between researching plans and sections and photographs and all those things for right. a case study when you're in architecture school or what if you could just go experience the building right and you also have the ability to like throw up a cut a section plane and push it through the building and understand spatial relationships right, right. in right there I, it is it is a different way to experience the concepts of architecture and could, what architecture can do and can be i think could you just imagine being potential. able to like stand in the center of like you know villa savoy and mm -hmm. say okay I see the space and all of this other stuff. How are they running the mechanical system? How are they doing this? And then be able to like toggle to section view where you're basically sitting there and you're staring at a section view where you're seeing the duct run and all of this other stuff where you're understanding things. Because, you know, one of the biggest disconnects that I think we all know when we're kind of learning how to design buildings are we don't not all programs teach you how to design all of the services in the building as they're teaching you <laughs> why am i laughing right now yeah. why, why why would i be laughing right now <laughs> and so and so, <laughs> and so you know to be, to be able to understand it's just like well why is that ceiling so low okay <laughs> you know sw swipe you can see the section you can see all of the different things or when I'm sitting in a meeting with some of these user groups and they're like, well, I don't understand why I can't do this. It's just, okay, here, boom, you're in your space. You can see the space. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. oh, I can fit, you know, my biological cabinets here. I've got my vent hoods there. You know, I've got all of this stuff here, but why is it so difficult for me to put this in this space? Zoop. And, you know, here you go. And you're now looking at a section with all of the duct work and all of the cable trays and everything else that's up above the ceiling. And she's like, oh, oh, oh now I, I understand. It, you know, so, so now they understand the compromise. <laughs> Look, bring it, bring it back in. <laughs> bring I have a back. short digression. I need you to define biological cabinets real quick. <laughs> Biosafety cabinets. 
<laughs> For those following along closely, yeah. I was just tripped up when you put those two words together. <laughs> By much, yeah. It's it's where they put the bad children. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you've spent time there before. Yeah, I've been I there. Get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. It's time I think, out for bad architects. And so then, that, then there's this, okay, let's take this to, to another degree, which is privacy and security. Now, there's definitely right. some buildings that not everybody should be able to go wherever they want, right, right? in that sure. virtual space, let alone the physical space, right? There's, there's physical barriers in buildings. And for if, like, it's a stadium, you can't see how to get to a certain place because right. it would compromise the security of the, sure. of the building. Same thing applies to this, and I just, just, I'll just throw it out there. Like this is also being addressed in these digital assets yeah. because you, as the architect or as the owner of the the physical building, need to be able to control that kind of a oh, thing, and, and that is a that's yeah. a part of the system as well. Yeah, I mean, but also think about the training that staff in you know large complexes can do through this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you need to be able to uh, basically assign permissions exactly. to whoever's going to exactly. view it for a different purpose. I and, mean, and that is, that's another layer of complexity right. that people need to start thinking about because, like, if it's a courthouse, you don't necessarily want to let everybody know exactly how yeah. back of house works, right? Right, sure. But, or a prison or, or, some, or a hospital even right. or a, a stadium, right? There's so many different or use cases. Plaza. But if you're training staff... Yeah, like you would want them to know right. exactly how to do it. If it's not built yet, it's under construction, you need to be really going on day one when the door is open right. and people can actually feel like they know the, the place already. I think that that has an interesting potential to unlock. Yeah, because if you, I mean, if you think about like, I mean, we've talked about this as like the future of the way that we permit things and because we're already creating a 3D asset, right? And if... New, if a fire department needs to understand how they are to access a building, where are the, where are the rated corridors? Where is the rated vestibule for, from your, like, what is the route from outside the building to inside the building through rated systems? And how do they get from floor to floor and all of these other things? And in mm -hmm. There's there's ways of obviously going out to the building and walking through physically and doing that. Sure, that that's you know primary number one. But if you think about it, like here we are training new people or things like that, and and you know you like you have uh, fire departments that have all these different assets of like all these different buildings in a downtown Manhattan or something that they have to service to be able to understand digitally like where you're going or be able to almost, <laughs> if you think about, if you think about like, um, uh, enemy of the movie, enemy of the state or something like that, where somehow they had like all of these 3d images and all of these like floor plans of all, of all these different buildings <laughs> that we know you're didn't just, ex exist at all. You're right? bringing people's nightmares. Exactly. To, to, but I mean, they're just like, right <laughs> turn left, you know, go to the elevator lobby and turn left and you'll see, Mission you know, impossible. You know, you're just yeah. like, right. first of all, <laughs> <laughs> Those three D assets didn't exist, you know. So we know that you, movie you know, magic, you know, right. movie magic, great. But now movie magic is becoming reality. And yeah. if you think about it, if if a fire service has that kind of technology, and you basically have a heads up display within their within their helmets or something like that as they're traversing through, especially in a things like, you know, like uh, smoke filled, you know, compartments or something like that, or flames or something. And you're just like, you know, there's beyond this smoke is another <laughs> compartment, you know, that you're going to need to check. But I mean, you also can't see all the junk in between you and that, that wall right. that's in the digital model. <laughs> well, true. But I mean, <laughs> like you know, chairs and desks and stuff. Uh, uh, yeah. That, that's, that's <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, but you know, if you just have a heads up display of saying, okay, I know that there's another there's room door beyond. Yeah. I may yeah. not be able to see it, but at least by the time I'm, you know, from here to there, at least I'll be able to like, you know, walk through there and know. You it's know, it's like the a chairs, game, the... right? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like this extra AR reality, uh, you know, the uh, augmented reality overlay over the, over yeah. the real world that, yeah. that gives you more information that could be useful for a lot of different scenarios. And 
So, so there's like the simulation ahead of time, like you're talking about, you have, you could, you could run scenarios virtually, completely virtually, yeah. but then there's like this augmented, you know, because there's, there's problems or whatever that you have to navigate in real time. That's an overlay over the real world. There's incredible possibility oh, yeah. here. And at the same time, it's. I mean, if you think about it, yesterday. We're still using AutoCAD. Yesterday I <laughs> was in the living room and I was going to the kitchen. My wife was in the dining room which is right in between the two rooms. And mm -hmm. she has her phone and she's pointing it towards the dining room table. And I'm like, what are you doing? I mean, she's, she sent me countless of links to all these different carpets that she wants to get for the dining room. And so here she is with her using her phone in AR to just oh, look to see, overlay. to overlay and see if like that How it looks. carpet would look in our dining room with our dining room yeah. set and the new new painted walls that she just painted and all of this other stuff. And they make it so easy to spend money, they, don't they? They, these they do. These, these and it was, it, it, what was funny <laughs> is it's like, you know, like Wayfair.com has got their own AR. Ikea yeah. has their Ikea. own AR. I mean, yeah. all of these different people Amazon. have, yeah, everybody has their own. How does it look in your room? You know, mm -hmm. it's just like, well, let's, it looks good, right? let's find out. <laughs> You're like, oh, oh. Yeah. And yeah. And that's, and more and more, that's what people are asking for is like, how is that going to look in my space? So I think what's super interesting, and I was talking with a friend yesterday about this, is if I was starting a practice today, and I think this is different than 12 years ago mm -hmm. in a major way, I would have a completely different tool set. Me starting with what I know, yeah. starting a small firm to practice architecture it would be very different than the usual suspects oh, of yeah. tools that used yeah. to be the the mainstay be of what was in your toolbox. Because different from starting a firm 12 years ago or 20 years ago, you have a way of using all of these visualizations as a way to leverage yourself in a different way. Because everybody communicate. Everybody has everybody has their mm -hmm. HGTV head on, right? They mm -hmm. want to see mm -hmm. what it looks like. They want to know how, they want to know things before you get a chance to know things, right? And so, you know, they want us to be those mind readers. And though we still aren't mind readers, we can at least use some of these tools to leverage ourselves to be different from those other architects that don't use these tools. And they're all readily available tools. I mean, I... I remember going on, and I can't remember, it was one of these like fan groups of classical architecture or modern architecture or whatever. And somebody had, somebody was doing something and they were asking about, well, I'm, I, I want to make this change to my, to whatever floor plan or whatever it was that they were, they were trying to do. Right. And they're like, but the architect is charging me this much for visualization, this much for renderings, this much for this. And it's just like, and then there's so many different people. It's just like, wait, you know, like this should be standard practice. This is, you know, 2023 or 2022, whenever I was like reading this and they're like, this should all be free. This is all free accessible stuff that anybody can get on online. And so, you know, this should just be a service that they give to you. And of course that, that starts its own conversation about like, you know, whether it's readily available or not, is this like our standard, you know, um, standard stuff that we provide people? You know, do we start providing, you know, does, as, as you said, you know, now you start thinking about operating the firm completely different. Yeah. Like, what right. do I offer yeah. as basic services? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And there are architects absolutely doing that. And so yeah. that's why it's even a question, right? I mean, people are saying that because, I mean, obviously it's insightful into yeah the pain that they're feeling, which right. is like, how come I can't get, right? And, and that's interesting from a, a, a business owner to a client mm -hmm. kind of a perspective and in that in, insight, because, right, if, if you constantly rely on how we used to do things as the model of how right. we continue to do things, then of course you're going to say, no, that's an additional service, or right. it only happens after DD, or no, there's no such thing as like, updates to renderings uh, throughout the project. Right. But these are all things that clients have asked for 
for decades. They right. want this stuff because they're spending the most money on it, yeah. and this is the longest process they've ever been through for anything. Right? It takes takes longer than going through high school to do these projects. <laughs> right? well, I mean, so, and if you think about it, I mean, it, it makes sense. In, in you're right. I mean, because like. Now with like all of these different plugins for all of the basic tools that we have, I mean, we've got real time rendering things that we've got that are add ons to Revit. I mean, I could pull up Revit right now in the screen next to me and show you all the different add ons that I have for all the different things that I can do, including right. AI, like AI inclusions in some of these add ons and add-ons to make just things a lot easier. And so there is the ability for us to be able to do that. But because we are in the kind of like traditional practice mindset, yeah, it's just like, oh, I don't normally do this. So like I'm going to have to. So this is where disruption comes from, right? And it's enabled by tech yeah. in this circumstance. And I think, yeah. so, so just to double down on my tool set would be very different if I started a practice today. Yeah. I could probably out-compete a firm of five or 10 people by yeah. myself yeah. with yeah. tools that are available today. Yeah. It, so, so that's what I mean by double down. Like I really feel like, and, and, and the goal, my, my goal would never be to like work more. Even I, I feel like I could, I feel like I could do that without even working more. But, but see, you know, <laughs> then, what's, what's in a normal though, schedule. But what's funny though is then, but then we need to change the mindset of the people who would be hiring us too, because say you're a sole practitioner who mm -hmm. you're competing for a small or medium-sized commercial project, right? Mm -hmm. But they say, oh, you're just one person. You know, How will you be able to do that when this is a five to 10 person firm and they've got the staff to be able to handle that? And you know, that's when the dialogue you know, has to happen, that the way that we practice and the way the tools we. that we have. <laughs> I use the word we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't need to know. It's my team. Your you, team is tech. Your team is computers. Your team is, I don't know. I, I, I'm just putting this out there as conversational. No, no, no. no I know that, but I'm not I mean, doing you know, this. I, yeah. I do feel like this is a very interesting topic of conversation that yeah. architects should be having with each other out right. loud because right. things are changing. The rug is being potentially pulled out from under our feet. Sure. And it's sure. not coming necessarily from within the profession because no. there are a lot of slow movers, slow adopters, if they adopt at all that are pulling sure. in the other direction. But again, I do think it's coming from the outside. And I think that's something to be keeping your eye on. Yep. Yeah. Both eyes. <laughs> both eyes. Yeah, sorry, not just your eye. That was not inclusive. Keep both eyes. Four <laughs> eyes. What? Keep all four eyes. On. All four of them. <laughs> yep. Well. Well, happy 12th year. Exactly. Cheers to take the, another sip of coffee, yeah, more caffeine. Thing. Cheers che to the cheers 12th to, year. <laughs> cheers to the 12th year. No promises on 12 more, people. <laughs> I hope I got 12 more in me. <laughs> Total. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whether it's sitting here talking on uh, whatever platform you're listening to or watching or whatever, or just in general. I feel you. <laughs> Ha, <laughs>